Hey everyone, this is Nick and my friends just had twins, which means they'll be locked inside for the best part of two years and so I will have a lot more time to work on the Linux and open source news videos instead of hanging out with them. Speaking of Linux and open source, this week we have the EU regulating AI and their first draft will probably hurt open source AI projects more than most others. We also have Ubuntu Unity being made an official Ubuntu flavor and we have ransomware and crypto miners increasingly targeting Linux. And speaking of Linux, how would you like to start your DevOps career thanks to today's sponsor? This video is sponsored by CodeCloud and if you want to start your DevOps career, I don't think there's a better option. They offer courses for the basics, for Docker, Kubernetes, Linux, general programming and infrastructure as code. You can take all courses at your own pace and most courses have an associated Slack channel where you can ask your questions to instructors and other students. And it's not just video lessons, you also get more than 200 labs that let you run exercises in real time in a virtual environment straight from your browser. For example, you could enroll in the Linux Foundation Certified System Administrator course, which will prepare you for the exam of the same name. At the end of this course, you'll have mastered the essential commands, the operations necessary to run systems, user and group management, networking, service configuration, storage management, and more. You can give CodeCloud a shot by creating a free account, giving access to some free courses and labs, and if you want to go further, they offer regional pricing, so you can get access to all of these learning resources at an affordable cost wherever you live. And they have a 30-day money-back guarantee if you end up deciding it's not for you. So if you plan to start your DevOps career, click the link in the description below and check out CodeCloud. Okay, so the EU is known for regulating technologies relatively early, sometimes for good, as in anti-monopolistic laws or privacy laws, and sometimes they miss the mark. Unfortunately, this time it looks like the latter. A proposal would limit the type of research that could be produced by AI tools by forcing open source developers to adhere to guidelines for risk management, data governance, tech documentation, transparency, cybersecurity, and more worryingly, accuracy. This means that these open source tools could be held liable in case they were used by a company and the results were disastrous in some way or other. The goal is laudable trying to ensure that AI projects are trustworthy and accountable, but the burdens it would place on open source projects might be enough to discourage smaller teams to even attempt to create anything. The end result being the concentration of most AI projects in the hands of big companies that will undeniably abuse these tools as they've done in the past with every other technology. The AI Act would also prevent the use of AI for social credit scoring, which is good. Just look at what China is doing and you'll see why this should never happen anywhere. And it also places restrictions on what they call high-risk AI systems, like what would be used in law enforcement. But heavy responsibility should be borne by the companies using the AI in their own products, not on the developer themselves. In short, I am all for regulating these tools, especially in the case of AI, which can absolutely be abused and misused by governments or companies. But the burden, the regulation burden, should be placed on the implementation, the commercial implementation of the tool, not on the open source project itself. Or we just risk another tech monopoly, which would be way worse for privacy in the end. Now, DuckDuckGo is a search engine you're probably familiar with and one I used for a long while before moving to something else. But they also have expanded their views to general privacy respecting solutions. And the latest one they made available to everyone is their email protection service. This thing lets you create email addresses to sign up for various services or newsletters and they'll be forwarded to your main address with all hidden trackers removed. They will also block tracking inside of email links and you can reply directly from these DuckDuckGo addresses without communicating your main address to anyone. It's also possible to remove an address to basically force unsubscribe yourself from a service that could be too pushy. On each mail you'll receive, you'll be able to see a privacy report to look at what DuckDuckGo has removed and the browser extension lets you generate new addresses inside of email fields in the websites you browse. So creating these is as easy as possible. 
On top of that, they will also upgrade all links inside emails to encrypted one with HTTPS. So all you need to do to use the service is enable it in DuckDuckGo's mobile app or in their browser extension. That's pretty good stuff, similar to what Apple offers or what Mozilla has with their Firefox Private Relay or Firefox Relay service. Although on DuckDuckGo's part, it seems to be entirely free. This week, like every week, we have some updates to GNOME and its apps. Calls, the phone dialer, got redesigned to look way nicer and handle long button labels better. PK Backup now helps with excluding files that are either too large or not necessarily needing to be backed up. And it lets you exclude a single file instead of full-on directories. Amberall, the music player, now supports replay gain metadata in the files and lets you follow that volume recommendation. It also supports external cover art files and fixes a bunch of small AI issues. Fosh, a mobile shell for GNOME, not to be mistaken for the official GNOME mobile shell project that hasn't really given any news recently, so Fosh got experimental support for lock screen widgets, like upcoming events. Komiku, the manga reader, is now ported to GDK4 and LibAdvita, with a nice UI redesign, two display modes and more. And finally, Gradients is now on Flathub, so you can tweak the appearance of your LibAdvita apps way more easily. The big GTK4 LibAdvita migration continues, and I personally think it's awesome. I really like the new LibAdvita look and feel, and if every app moves to that, then my desktop is more coherent, so props on that. Not to be outdone, KDE devs have also worked hard on their own desktop and apps, specifically letting you set a color temperature for day and night in the night color feature that reduces blue light emissions from your screen, which is pretty cool. Discover will also now display content ratings for applications that support them and lets you change the name you use when submitting an application review, on top of getting a share button to let you send the app's link to someone else and checking if there's enough space before updating, something that will come in handy on my Steam Deck as I constantly run out of space on it. Smaller changes this week includes the desktop remembering window positions on a per screen basis on multi-monitor setups, the media controller in the taskbar being able to display the title, artist and album art of the currently playing song, and zooming in is now doable by pressing meta plus the plus key. The next weeks should be less eventful and less focused on features and user interface improvements and more on bug fixing as they are nearing the release of KDE Plasma 5.26, which should be live in October in about six weeks. So they already started on that and they already fixed 112 bugs this week, which is enormous. It looks like Linux servers are increasingly targeted by ransomware and general malware. Ransomware detections have grown by 75% over the past few years, and crypto mining malware grew by 145% as well. Now, of course, it's only logical, as Linux servers are the backbone of the internet, which means attackers are now aiming for Linux-based systems more and more. After all, if you can manage to encrypt a full server with all its user data and ransom the company that operates it, or if you can use the power of server hardware to mine crypto for yourself, it's bound to be more profitable than trying to attack individuals, even at scale. That's why Lockbit, one of the most prolific ransomware operations, now has a Linux variant, for example. Now, to achieve their goals, these malicious actors use unpatched vulnerabilities, like the dirty pipe flaw, which affects the Linux kernel from version 5.8 and up. So yeah, you know what to do. Just get your security updates and apply them to your servers, to your desktops. Just always be up to date with what your distro ships. And don't think that Linux is safer than Windows just because it's Linux. You still need to pay attention to security on Linux as well. This week, we also have updates to Elementary OS, this time with a bigger focus on OS 7. Users of 6.1 will get a few fixes on the desktop settings, but mostly the team has been working on the next release. The App Center, their graphical app store, has been reworked to work on smaller window sizes and on bigger ones. It sports a new search bar right in the header bar and has a dedicated updates button instead of making you choose between updates or installing apps. Release notes are now shown in a dialogue instead of inline, and app pages now wrap better when the windows are tall and narrow, and have an accent color background behind screenshots. App Center is also being ported to GDK4. 
The system settings are also more responsive, with panels being redesigned and ported to GDK4. But while this all looks pretty cool, there is still no release date for OS 7. And we're more than four months after the release of the LTS that OS 7 will be based on, so it's already starting to get a bit old, which sucks. But at least these changes to the App Center might make it to Pop OS, for example, because the Pop Shop is based on the Elementary OS App Center, so maybe they'll be able to benefit from that. If you were a fan of Unity, the desktop environment, not the game engine, you probably know about Ubuntu Unity, a really cool implementation of that desktop environment on a modern Ubuntu base, and with a few improvements and a cool redesign as well. Well, it turns out the kid who did all that work can be proud because Ubuntu Unity is now an official Ubuntu flavor, just as much as Kubuntu, Xubuntu and all the others. Well, it will be an official version starting with Ubuntu 22.10 next month, at least. Which means I will probably have to include it in my review alongside all the other flavors. This was proposed in August, voted on and accepted, as they have been maintaining their distro for a while now. They have a team with enough people to ensure things can go smoothly, and a lot of their packages are straight from the Ubuntu repos, which are already maintained by the main Ubuntu team, or in use in another official flavor. I, for one, I'm pretty happy about this. I always loved Unity, and having it back as an official Ubuntu flavor might mean that more people will get interested in working on it, which is cool. Still on the topic of distros, Deepin 20.7 was released this week, bringing a few nice improvements. First, they now have added the HWE kernel, a version that adds support for more recent hardware. They use version 5.18 here. On top of that, they improved their grand search feature by supporting Google search and by letting users choose the search engine that will be used by default. The control center has also been adjusted, especially for input methods and keyboard layouts. The mail client, which I quite liked last time I looked at Deepin, now has calendar functionality, and the email composer has seen some improvements to rich text messages. Smaller things include the camera app letting you save videos as MP4, more fingerprint scanner support, and Firefox now supports NVIDIA video accelerator decoding. I tried Deepin a few months ago and I was pleasantly surprised. It's not lacking much to be a contender to my desktop of choice, although I would not use the Deepin distro but more the Deepin desktop on another distro. And let's complete this video with some Linux gaming news. First, we have Linux slowly but surely climbing the ladder of Steam market share. Linux now represents about 1.3% of reported Steam users seeing a pretty nice rise in the past few months. Ubuntu is still the most used distro for gaming, with 22.04 and 20.04 combined, reaching 15.26%. But SteamOS is going to steal their launch in the future, as it already hits 13.69%. Nice. Dbrand has also unveiled the full details of their Project Kill Switch, their complete protection kit for the Steam Deck. For about $60, it includes a case, a kickstand that can be removed and affixed magnetically, and one customizable skin. If you add $15, you also get a travel cover and stick grips. Apparently, it won't include a screen protector, as Dbrand estimated that these have been sold for six months or more already, and that basically everyone who pre-ordered their Project Kill Switch already has a screen protector, often from Dbrand. Personally, I would never put such a huge case, screen protectors, stick grips and whatever else on my Steam Deck. It would just make it too bulky and heavy and I mostly play from home so it doesn't need that extra protection. But if you're always gaming on the go, maybe that's something that might interest you. Now, what else might interest you? Yes, today's sponsor, Tuxedo. Tuxedo makes laptops and desktops that run Linux out of the box. The hardware is specifically picked to work well with Linux, and while you can pick from a selection of popular distros when buying your device, you can also install anything you like and be sure that it's gonna work because the hardware is compatible with Linux. They have a nice big range of devices that should fit basically everyone, from the smallest Nux and Ultrabooks to the biggest workstations or gaming laptops and everything in between. 
And each device can be configured with CPU options, RAM options, SSDs, disk storage, RAID storage, keyboard layouts, your lid on the logo, you name it. Basically, yeah, they have options for everything. And on top of that, they ship worldwide. So if you need a new device and you want to make sure that you support Linux development and that your device actually runs well with Linux, click the link in the description below and get yourself a Tuxedo laptop or desktop. They are really, really good. Now, thanks everyone for watching the video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, don't hesitate to like, to subscribe, to turn on notifications, to write a comment. And if you didn't like the video, well, dislike it. And also tell me why in the comments, please. It's, it's just more polite this way. And if you really, really like the video and you really enjoy the channel, you can help support it by joining my Patreon subscribers or YouTube members. Both get access to a weekly podcast on Mondays and the right to vote on the next topics I'll cover at the end of each month. And if you just want to support one time, there's a super thanks button underneath the video and a PayPal link in the description. So thanks everyone for watching and I guess you'll see me in the next one. Bye!